Hi, this is Aaron Bossler. I'm a clinical pathologist at the University of Iowa and direct our molecular pathology laboratory. Today, I'm gonna to be talking to you about our experience with optical mapping for the molecular diagnosis of fasciosscapulohumeral muscular dystrophy or FSHD. I don't have any disclosures to uh, um, present. So the objectives of my talk today are for us to understand the clinical manifestations and etiology of FSHD, outline the molecular testing goals that we have, and then compare and contrast the results from optical mapping with that of traditional southern blot analysis. So the clinical features of FSHD uh, include that this is an autosomal dominant myopathy characterized by progressive muscle atrophy and weakness. Prevalence is about one in 10,000 to uh, 20,000. And the disease manifestations and age of onset are uh, variable depending on the mutation. Symptoms typically arise in adolescence with over 90% of individuals uh, being affected before the age of 20. There are uh, presentations that are severe uh, infantile uh, FSHD, and some individuals with mutation may remain asymptomatic. So it's more likely to be uh, in females. But for the most part, the disease course uh, is progressive with 20% of affected individuals requiring a wheelchair. FSHD affects characteristic muscle groups, uh, in particular, uh, facial muscle weakness is one of the predominant signs in individuals who manifest FSHD. Uh, one of the other typical finds is with the lower trapezius uh, and the development of upward scapular winging. There are also extra muscular manifestations with retinal vasculopathy, sensory neural hearing loss, chronic pain, uh, and um, in uh, severe infantile FSHD, uh, usually retinopathy and hearing loss, developmental delay, intellectual disability, uh, seizures, and more rapid disease progression. So the cause of FSHD really boils down to the aberrant expression of a gene called DUX4. DUX4 is a homeobox transcription factor um, that is present on chromosome four, whose expression is normal in early developmental stages. But beyond that time point, it's very toxic to the cells that it's expressed in, in particular muscle cells, uh, but other cells uh, in the adolescent and adult individual. Now, it's taken us a long time to get to this point of understanding this very uh, brief statement. Uh, and part of this is because the DUX4 open reading frame overlaps with a repeat array referred to as the D4Z4. This repeat is about 3,300 base pairs in length. And normal alleles have anywhere from 11 to 100 repeats that are usually hypermethylated, which suppresses the expression of the DUX4. But deletion of these repeats or contraction of the repeat array to 10 units or less leads to relaxation of the chromosomal structure. And with this relaxation, you get derepression of DUX4 and transcription of the open reading frame from the last uh, repeat element. Additionally, you have to have a functional polyadenylation sequence uh, in the last open reading frame of the gene. And sequencing has identified that there's two primary haplotypes. The A haplotype contains the, the functional polyadenylation sequence following the uh, DUX4 exon. And so you get um, translation from the uh, stable mRNA transcript. Whereas the B haplotype sequences um, have variations in the signal sequence where it's completely absent. And with this loss, you don't get functional DUX4 um, uh, transcripts. They're degraded uh, prematurely. And so uh, there's no FSA, no um, uh, protein expression, and these are considered non-permissive alleles. These sequences are different enough that you can use uh, southern blot probes to differentiate these uh, two primary haplotypes. Another complicating factor of uh, molecular diagnosis is that the D4Z4 repeat has a homologous sequence on chromosome 10. These share 99, 98 to 99% sequence homology. Um, now they can be distinguished using restriction enzyme digest and southern blot analysis. 
um, because there are different restriction sites in the four type alleles from the 10 type alleles. There's an XAP restriction enzyme site in the four type alleles and BLN restriction sites in the 10 type alleles. So that when you perform Southern blot analysis and you hybridize to uh, this gray area here that's referred to as the P13E11 uh, probe sequence, um, when you digest with uh, EcoR1, you're not able to differentiate four and 10 type alleles. But if you do additional digests with either uh, ECO and BLN or XAP1 by itself, you can differentiate the alleles that are coming from chromosome four or chromosome 10. The chromosome 10 alleles have sequence uh, differences in the poly A signal motif. So they appear as the 4QA haplotype, but they're non-permissive uh, for expressing the DUX4 gene. Unfortunately, about 20% of individuals have rearrangements between chromosomes four and 10. And so along with this being present on 10, you have rearrangements that would potentially give you a permissive chromosome four type allele on chromosome 10. And these can be difficult to, uh, to tease out. So about 95% of FSHD is due to these contractions of the D4Z4 repeat. And we refer to this as FSHD type one. But we've also found that this doesn't explain all of the clinical phenotypes uh, of individuals out there. And we've come to identify that about 5% of FSHD patients have mutations in one of the methylation regulating genes, SMCHD1. Uh, it plays an important role in methylating the D4Z4 repeat. And so mutations that result in loss of function or absence of SMCHD1 can result in hypomethylation and DUX4 expression. This is usually tied to some contraction of the D4Z4 repeat, um, somewhere between 11 and 35 repeats. But clinically, FSHD type one and type two are indistinguishable. So goals of FSHD molecular testing, I've boiled down into these five components as we understand them currently. So, Measuring the number of repeats or the length of the alleles is one of the first steps. Second is discriminating whether these alleles are present on chromosome four or chromosome 10. Third is determining whether there is the permissive or non-permissive polyadenylation sequence. Four is evaluating the methylation status. If you don't have a contraction that is consistent with FSH, FSHD type one, to identify someone who might have FSHD type two. And then if there is hypomethylation present, then looking to see if there's loss of function variance in SMCHD1, usually by uh, sequencing. So Southern blotting uh, achieves many of these components. We can measure the number of repeats. We can discriminate chromosome four from chromosome 10. We can determine the permissive 4QA and 4QB status. And we can also look at methylation using a different set of restriction enzymes of EcoR1, Bagel2, uh, and then FSE1, FSE uh, which, is, which is methylation sensitive. Uh, and then if you follow this up with sequencing uh, of the SMCHD1 locus, you can cover all of these components. And there's an example, uh, pulse field gel electrophoresis southern blot, uh, showing the Eco, EcoBLN, and XAP digest lanes in comparison with the, um, with the latter. One of the disadvantages of Southern blotting is that we have to use radioactivity. Another is that we can't clearly discriminate uh, the gene rearrangements all the time. And so, uh, and you use a lot of DNA and it's a slow turnaround time. So we looked at single molecule optical mapping to see if we could improve this. Uh, and uh, the idea here is that you perform imaging of fluorescently tagged singularly linearized genomic DNA molecules, very long DNA molecules uh, of at least 200,000 base pairs in length. Now this is best obtained from fresh blood, but we've found uh, that frozen whole blood will work also. Uh, and this is advantageous for determining genomic structural abnormalities, um, deletions, insertions, duplications, translocations, or inversions. In this case, we're looking for the large deletion. And the manufacturer had said that uh, um, Bionano has told us that discrimination has the ability of plus or minus 500 base pairs, which we found in our validation to be true. So the process here is that you have to isolate high molecular weight DNA, 
We've done this using our own internal method and by the specimen processing uh, kit that BioNano has provided to us. Um, and then you can label the DNA, fluorescently tag it, either using a NIC label system or a direct label system. The NIC label system actually cuts one of the strands of DNA and in so doing potentially fragments the DNA further. So we opted for the direct label method, which doesn't cut the DNA and just directly labels, puts the fluorescent tag on the DNA. Once the labeling is completed, then we load the DNA onto the, the chip or the cartridge, uh, which is full of nanochannel uh, uh, arrays uh, so that we can separate the individual molecules and then perform imaging uh, to, to uh, uh, take pictures of the, the fluorescently tagged DNA. Once the separation has completed, uh, the algorithms convert the images into molecules. Uh, and then these are aligned de novo, kind of like a restriction fragment length uh, pattern would be. And then these can, can be compared against uh, a reference sequence, the green bar here, to identify uh, here the sum of all of your um, uh, optically mapped uh, molecules to see in this instance where the labels are separated indicating that there's an insertion. Here's an example of uh, some of these molecule maps. The molecules are indicated in the uh, amber and the blue marks are where the fluorescent tag has occurred. Uh, the summative uh, sequence is shown here in blue or the uh, uh, labeled map compared to the expected labeling of the reference map here in green. When we look more closely at uh, the end of chromosome four, where the D4Z4 repeat array is present, using the direct labeling method, um, uh, there are fluorescent tags at the beginning and the end of the array, but none that occur uh, within the repeat array. And so you actually have to measure the length of the array, subtract out the non-repeat sequence and divide by 3300 to get the number of repeats that are present. Uh, and that works uh, pretty well. And I'll show you our data here in a second. The other ability though, is that the uh, permissive A haplotype and non-permissive B haplotype sequences are pretty well discriminated by the fluorescent tags um, uh, as shown here in the red and the green boxes. Uh, and so in one labeling, you're able to figure out the number of repeats and the haplotype sequence. Now BioNano has also built a, a specific analysis pipeline uh, to look at the repeat sequences present on chromosome four and chromosome 10. And they also built into this the analysis of um, the SMCHD1 locus on chromosome 18. Um, there are uh, reported deletions uh, and rearrangements of chromosome 18 that have contributed to mutations in SMCHD1. And so being able to tie this into a single analysis is very helpful. And so the program calculates and reports the number of repeats the chromosome that they're present on and the haplotype sequence. And then the chromosome 18 status uh, is shown separately. It takes about two to four hours to do this computation once the um, uh, separation has been performed um, in comparison to looking at the entire genome, uh, which can take uh, 16 to 24 hours. So when we look at our validation data, um, looking at the sizing first, we found that the optical mapping had very high correlation with the southern blot analysis. Um, the graph here shows the sizing by the BioNano on the x-axis and uh, southern blot analysis on the y. And uh, um, we had 146 unique uh, alleles representing from 1 to 79 repeats that showed very high correlation uh, greater than 94%. Um, that you can see here uh, with the smaller alleles, the sizing is um, uh, much more, uh, much tighter uh, versus the larger alleles. And in fact, uh, alleles greater than 145 or 190,000 base pairs by Southern blot were not able to size by Southern. Uh, and so uh, we couldn't do an adequate con comparison of these. And there were uh, 17 of those alleles. And these are both chromosome four and chromosome 10 uh, alleles. Furthermore, when we look at the A and B haplotyping, we had 163 total alleles, again, chromosome four and chromosome 10. Uh, and we had uh, only one of these alleles 
not be able to discriminate. And that was more because of the poor quality Southern blot and our inability to go back and, and repeat any of the testing because there was uh, no sample left. So very high correlation with what we expected for haplotyping based on the Southern blot result. Furthermore, the optical mapping allowed us to discriminate or find alleles that we weren't necessarily expecting to detect. And these fell into two categories. Uh, there were five total alleles. One of these, the optical mapping showed us that there was actually a low level mosaic allele, a fifth allele, that was just uh, too low of a signal to pick up by Southern blot. The other four cases though, had alleles where um, the sizing, and that's what's shown in the example on the right-hand side here, uh, for this chromosome 10, um, these two alleles are very closely matched in size, and we weren't able to discriminate this on the southern blot. It looks like a single band. Um, and so there were four instances where we were able to identify um, what appeared to be um, one allele by southern blot as two different alleles uh, because of the optical mapping patterns. And then uh, we had one example of a chromosome 18 structural abnormality. This is the uh, circos plot that you see uh, with the de novo analysis, identifying this deletion here on chromosome 18, which included the SMCHD1 locus. It was uh, something that we expected uh, in this case, but it clearly demonstrates that deletion. So when we look at those five different goals of analysis, the optical mapping performed efficiently and effectively for three out of those five. It can measure the number of repeats. Uh, it can determine the permissive 4QA and B uh, sequence uh, status, and it can discriminate um, the presence of chromosome, uh, the repeats on chromosome four or chromosome 10. It's not able to discriminate the, the four and 10 repeats themselves, and we're not currently able to do um, uh, the methylation uh, analysis. And so then lastly, when we look at the impact on the laboratory uh, from a workflow and uh, a management standpoint, uh, we've determined that the optical mapping is about half the cost of Southern blot analysis, that there's uh, a lot less tech time involved in doing the optical mapping. Um, the specimen requirements are significantly lower with the amount of blood that we have to use, and our turnaround time is much faster in uh, doing the optical mapping. Um, we're also trying to get rid of radioactivity. Uh, so this has significantly reduced our use of radioactivity and it's uh, improved our overall quality assurance because the size discrimination is so much better um, with the optical mapping. So in summary, optical mapping showed strong correlation with Southern blot analysis with the D4Z4 allele sizing. Um, there's near, near perfect correlation with the Southern blot for the haplotyping, it resolved the ambiguity for cases with multiple four type alleles detected by Southern blot. It allows us to detect alleles that are not detected by Southern blot. So there's a higher sensitivity for low level mosaic alleles and can discriminate uh, down to plus or minus one repeat. We can also detect the structural variants for, SM, for the SMCHD1 locus. Um, and in our reproducibility, um, there's very high precision uh, and repeatability in, uh, uh, in our repeat testing. So I'll just wrap up by thanking uh, members of our laboratory who were involved in this validation. Uh, Aaron Stentz was the primary driver of all the um, uh, test development. Uh, and our molecular fellow, John Thomason, was uh, closely involved in the data analysis. Uh, John Priestner, our molecular lab advisor, um, supervisor, um, uh, who was integral in, in getting the uh, instrumentation into the laboratory, and Dr. Steve Moore, um, who oversees the sign out of all the clinical diagnostic testing that we do. Thank you.